Okay, we should be live. Welcome to the beginning Hebrew class. I can't see anybody who's sitting standing behind the board over there, but uh, that's you guys, that's okay. And I need this and I need that. You're okay, as long as you can see what's going on. I don't have to see you, as long as you can see what's going on. I had here somewhere, here it is. All right, so this is a cool thing. You can see the dot on here, potentially. Um, and you can see the dot on here, potentially. I'm going to be using this, too. Can you see this? If I turn it now, I don't know if it's going to, you want to check to see if we've got that. So today we're going to start learning beginning Hebrew. I call my class, is it too cold for you all of a sudden? It was 78 degrees about three minutes ago. Um, the good news is the air conditioning is working. <laughs> what happened? Okay. I call the class Hebrew from day one because as of the first day, you'll be able to read some Hebrew. Um, the goal of this class is to be able to read every letter of the Aleph Bet. If you remember learning how to read the first time, I presume most of you started your first language that you had to learn how to read was English, then you got to read words that you already knew. If you were sounding out cat, that's because you already knew what a cat was. And unfortunately in Hebrew, that's not exactly what happens. In Hebrew, we will be sounding out a whole bunch of things that you may not have any clue what you're reading. So I tried to pick a text that I thought would be something that you would want to know how to say in Hebrew if you didn't know any Hebrew at all. Um, and I picked the first day of creation. So that's why I call it day one, learning Hebrew from day one. The first day of creation has all but seven of the Hebrew letters. So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna show you that all the material that we're talking about is also online. So if you go to, this is the hebrewdoc.com page, and if you go there, and you go to, there's a whole bunch of ways of getting there. I'm going to sit, well, one is if we go to beginning Hebrew for adults then on the bottom here, you should find these links to a whole bunch of things. So the first thing we're gonna do, and you'll notice that each of these are different colors. We have a limited no amount of time. We've gotta be out of here in time for the next class. So I'm gonna jump kind of to it. The first thing we're gonna do in each class is we're going to sing the Aleph Bet song. I wanna let you know that the goal of the class is to be able to read Hebrew. And to be able to read Hebrew, you do not need to know the names of the letters. I'm not going to be quizzing you on what the names of the letters are because what you need to be able to do is sound them out. In English, what I found when I was teaching kids how to read English, often because they're so ingrained in learning what the names of the letters are, they say the name of the letter instead of the sound. So if they're trying to read, uh, if there's a word with an L in it, for example, instead of saying U, they'll say L and throw that in there. So I want to remind you that the important thing is knowing how to sound out the letters. You don't have to know the names of them to be able to read. But eventually you're gonna wanna know the names of the letters for two reasons. One is if you ever have to look something up in alphabetical order, it really helps to know the order and that's why I teach you a song. And the song that we learn at the beginning class has the names of the letters in it. But also, unlike English, in Hebrew, the name of the letter, of every single letter, begins with the consonant sound that the letter makes. So for example, if the name of the letter, uh, I'll pull it up on here so you can see it easier. If the name of the letter is bet, then the sound of the letter is b. Unlike in English, where you have letters like, and I don't usually write English on the board, but what's the name of that letter? And, and it starts with eh, and this one starts with eh, the name of it starts with eh. And I mean, you'll find a whole bunch of letters that don't start with the sound that it makes. In Hebrew, every single consonant starts with the consonant sound that the letter makes. Having said that, I have to give you our first disclaimer. And that is that the very first letter of the Aleph Bet is, as you can imagine, sorry, that's gonna keep popping up. I don't. It is almost full and we'll play with it eventually, but. Um, the very first letter of the Aleph Bet is Aleph. 
And Aleph doesn't start with a consonant sound. Actually, it does. It seems to start with a vowel sound. It seems to start with ah. But before you can get to ah, you have to close down your throat and open it up. It's called a glottal stop. So the consonant sound that it makes is kind of a silent sound. So you can think of it as a, con a silent consonant, but the, this vowel is going to sound like and this one's going to sound like b because it's called a bet, and we'll go on from there. I don't want you to think that you have to know all of the letters today. We're only going to learn a handful of letters today, and you're only going to have to read a little bit of, of the text. But first, we're going to sing the song. So we sing. Um, repeat after me. Aleph, bet, vet. Now, we are streaming this. They can't hear anything that you're saying because you're not on a mic, so sing loud, because it's the only way you're going to learn. I will sing your part, too, so people can hear. Aleph, bet, vet. Aleph, bet, vet. Gimel, dalit, hey. Gimel, dalit, hey. Vav, zayin, chet, tet. Vav, zayin, chet, tet. Yud, kaf, chaf. Yud, kaf, chaf. Lamid, mehem, nun. Lamid, mehem, nun. Samech, ayin, pefe. Samech ayin pefe, tzadi kufresh, tzadi kufresh, shin, sin, tav, ba, ba, da, ba, da, shin, sin, tav, ba, ba, da, ba, da. Good. We're going to start every day with that. Um, this is all online, so you can review it. It's on the, the beginning Hebrew at hebrewdoc.com site. And uh, it's got, whoop, it shouldn't have gone all the way back to there. Go back to beginning Hebrew for adults. That's just the text alone, but there's also songs. So you'll get this one, the alphabet repeat, if you want to hear it as a, an MP3. And as we're doing the class, I'm loading up things, other stuff. So if there are things that you want to have in this class, just let me know, and I'll put it up there too. So we're going to the Learn Hebrew from Day 1 page. And you'll see, you start here with the alphabet song. Let me show you this. If you see this in purple then what you get is something called Show Me. Show Me is a program that I create files on my iPad, and you get to see and hear at the same time. I like that. So f we can do this. Watch. Oh, but I don't have. I already said that. That the letter makes. That's what it is. So, for example, if the letter is lamid, you have it will to hear sound all this like again. Nuh. If the letter is pe, it will sound like pa, etc. Unlike, for example, in English, where the letter L starts with an e sound, you get and doesn't this. Start with a consonant sound at all. I'm not going to go through this whole thing because we just did the song. What I am going to show you is that you'll notice that I've got two Aleph Bet charts up here. One says complete alphabet, and the other says the alphabet song. Officially, if you ask me how many letters there are in the Hebrew alphabet, anybody know how many letters there are in the Hebrew alphabet? How many? 26 in the English alphabet. Alphabet. How many in the Hebrew alphabet? So there are officially 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. But if you count either of these charts, you'll find more than 22 on both of them. And that's because if you're because the one on the right, the complete alphabet, shows you every consonant with the sounds, each possible way that it can sound, including final letters. There are five letters that are written different at the end of, differently at the end of a word. The alphabet song has more than 22 because of things like this. These are not things you have to remember, but it could con you could say between now and next week, you could say, hey, wait a second. I thought there were only 22 letters. How come I'm seeing more than that? This letter, bet, has a dot in it, called a dagesh. This letter, which we're calling vet, is the exact same letter as that. We're giving it a different name because it has a different sound and it's easier to learn. If you pretend that there is such a thing as a vet, but it's actually a bet with a dagesh and without a dagesh. So because it's a different sound, it's a lot easier when you're learning it to think of it as a different letter. But it's really the same letter, it just comes in different places. So we go back now to the first lesson. Each of these has complete lesson plans that you can print out if you go to the black 
uh, at the top of each of the lesson things. And the purples over here are the, the show me file practice, which is gonna be probably the best way for you to be practicing. And eventually you'll get to things like the text with letter files and all kinds of stuff, and I'll show you all of that. But what I wanna do first is go back to, we did the Aleph bet. Next thing I wanna do, where it says start here, I would like to do the Aleph bet aerobics, the vowel aerobics. I learned the hard way that one of the easiest ways to learn Hebrew, I used to teach a few vowels at a time. One of the easiest ways to learn Hebrew is if you learn all the vowels up front. And the way I do it is what I call aerobics. You get to be the vowels. So for example, we have this letter, which in this case is colored because the color represents the sound, but it, well, it's not showing up on there the way it's showing up on, on your screen. But this letter is an aleph. It represents kind of the silent consonant. Um, and so I can't do an X with a vowel underneath it. It's supposed to be a place marker. It's supposed to show you where the vowel would come. You'll see the black part underneath the aleph. That over here, that's the vowel. So if you see a vowel that looks like this, I want everybody to stretch. Don't hit anybody. Stretch out like this and say, ah. Uh, so if you see this vowel underneath a letter, then you know that sounds like ah. Uh. And if you see this vowel here, a straight line, then I want you to stretch like this and say ah. Uh. So the stretching vowels both say ah, uh, ah. Uh. Then we've got this one, the teeniest, tiniest vowel. It's just one little dot, and you're squeaking your nose, and it sounds like e. Let me hear an e. e. Then we've got the squeaky nose vowel, but you're bending your ear down. Let's see, we're going this way. You're bending your ear down like this, so it makes a yud. So when you have the squeaky nose vowel and you bend your ear, it still says e. So try it, e. So here's your first quiz. What's this one when it's shaped like this? Ah, uh, uh, nobody did it though, come on. Ah, uh, how about if it's one line underneath, it's ah. Uh, and if it's this one, squeaky nose, e. And if you have squeaky nose with this, it's e. Now we go down a little bit, and we have, I'm gonna do it like this. These two dots is this one and this, and it's going eh. We do this more in New York. You say eh, or I'm gonna call it the fed up vowel, eh, eh. You'll notice that the letter here is red to remind you that it's an eh, eh. Sometimes I'm really fed up, and I have this dot, and this dot, and this dot, and I go eh. So try it again, eh. So we're gonna go through one more time, backwards. This vowel is ah, and this vowel is ah, and this vowel is e, and this vowel is e, and this vowel is e, and this vowel is e. We got more, now we have blue. So this one, you're zooming down a tube slide, right here, zooming down the tube slide. My problem is if I say zooming, I can't tell you how many times people are going to say that the vowel sound is z. It's not z. It's ooh. Let me see you do ooh as you zoom down the tube slide. Ooh. And then we have this vowel. This is not underneath. It's the first time that the whole vowel is not underneath. It's next to. This is what we like to call Mr. Vov. Mr. Vov is up at bat, and the pitcher pitches it in to his stomach, and he says ooh. So let's see, this one is an ooh, and this one is an ooh. Oh, you forgot to do it with me. Come on, try it again. Mr. Vov is up at bat, and it goes like ooh into his stomach, and then you're zooming down the tube slide, and it's ooh. And then we have Mr. Vov up at bat again, and the pitcher pitches it over his head, and he says, oh. Let's try that one. Oh. Sometimes we have the ball going over the head, but it, there's no vav at all. And it still sounds like, oh. You may have noticed there's a pattern here that I've got a vowel on the right and a vowel on the left, and they both sound the same. If I showed it to you on another chart, which I have over here somewhere, you will see that I, one of these versions is a long vowel, and one of these versions is a short vowel of the same, not of the same, of the same sound. And you'll notice that the long vowel and the short vowel across the way here both sound the same, essentially. In modern Hebrew, this is going to sound like ah, 
and this is going to sound like ah, and this is going to sound like e, and this is going to sound like e, even though all of these in this column are long vowels, and all of these in this column are short vowels. So now that we have Mr. Vav up at, up at bat over here, and we've got, my cloud is still almost full, go figure. Come on, go away. Then now that we have these here, and you know that this one is an O, and this one's an O, what do you expect this saddest, most misunderstood vowel to be? Oh, he's doing this, oh. His mouth is making that shape. Because a lot of people think that this vowel is actually this vowel, because in many texts it looks exactly the same. And so they misunderstand and they mispronounce him all the time. And he's very sad about that, so he says, oh. So you now have all of the essential vowels. If you've studied another language, you'll know that the essential core vowels are a, e, i, o, u, and that's what you've got here. We have a couple of other that are diphthongs, which means you have to combine two vowels together, but I'll save those for next time to do. Today what we're going to do is we're going to start learning some consonants, and this is what we're doing. We are starting from day one. Oop. The first text, the first two words of the Torah, how God, the words that God used to create the world, the first two words of the Torah, I'm going to tell them to you first, are bereshit bara. Those are the words, bereshit bara. And by the end of the lesson, you will be able to read bereshit bara. So it starts off with this one. I'm going to tell you how to write these letters and the way you write it is going to help you remember it. The things that I tell you about the shape of it will help you remember it. So we have, you know how in English we have core shapes? So every letter is made up of either lines or circles or part of circles and the core shapes repeat to make different kinds of letters. If I add them together I can make other things. The same is true in Hebrew. But a couple of things are different in Hebrew than in English. One is, obviously, Hebrew goes from right to left. And uh, we'll talk about that later. But the other is that in, in English, when you're writing letters, you write from the bottom of the line, and that's your base. In Hebrew, your lines are like this, and you're always writing from the top of the line, and your letters hang. I like to think of it as God used these letters to create the world, and the letters are hanging out in heaven and they've got to come down to be able to make the world for us. That's my story, I'm sticking to it. So the letters all start from the top. But just like we have core shapes in English, we have core shapes in Hebrew. So this is a core shape, kind of round up here. And that's how this letter is gonna start. But underneath the left part of this, we're gonna make a bar on the bottom and the base goes beyond. Bar on the bottom, base goes beyond. And there's a ball or a belly button in the middle. There's a ball or a belly button in the belly. So there's a bar on the bottom, a base goes beyond, and a ball or a belly button in the middle, and it sounds like b. Bar on the bottom, base goes beyond, ball in the belly, and it's a b. So if we know that, we can do a couple things. If you go to the lesson page, it will tell you all of these things. It will tell you that because it's the letter bet, which is the second letter of the Aleph bet, it represents the number two. Every consonant also represents a number. But we can also practice by looking at these, come here. So you'll notice that some of these letters are thicker than others. That's because these are actually in the, f in the less than the first two. I'm going to see if I can make that a little bit clearer. I'm feeling it's a little bit blurry. Let's try that. All right, so let's start at the beginning. We'll turn this back on. So this one is bigger than that, and that's just because this combination of consonant and vowel is going to be in our first two words in the Bereshit bara. So if you have a, a B and you have, what's this vowel again? So what does it sound like? Ba. So that's a Ba. Did you know that? Did everybody know that already? Anybody here come with no Hebrew? Half of you came with no Hebrew already, which means you're reading Hebrew. That's cool. When I say Hebrew from day one, I mean it. So this one is a Ba. And what's this one? Ba, and this one is be, and this one is be, and this one is b, because it's got the b, and then we move them over, and this one is b, and this one is 
Bo, and this one is Bo, and this one is Boo. Just tried to scare you there, didn't work. And this one is Boo, and this one we didn't talk about yet um, because it wasn't on the chart that's posted, and I'm a little bit surprised that it isn't because I have a chart with this. But unless it's lower down, it could be a second page because I made those as flashcards, so it may be a second page. This with the two dots, I like to think of this as a stop sign. So you've got uh, the two kinds of a, a light, a traffic light. So instead of having three dots, it's got two dots. One is green and one is red, and they're gonna be on top of each other. And it's either going to show you that there is a movement or it's a resting. It's called the schwa in English. You may have heard of a schwa. The schwa is officially kind of the absence of vowel sound, but it is a vowel marker. Every consonant in the middle of a word, until you get to the end of the word, every consonant has to have a vowel or a vowel, vowel marker. So sometimes when we have a kind of an absence of sound in the middle of a word or at the beginning of a word, we need one of these. If it's at the beginning of a word or syllable, then it's going to move. So it's going to be like, uh, and which of course sounds like what? My kids. What does uh sound like? Does it sound like somebody just burped? So when we say uh, then the kids are polite and they learn how to say slicha, that means excuse me. So when we make a moving schwa, let's try it. Uh, slicha, try it again. Uh, slicha. When it's resting, I show it like this and it's silent. So let's try it again. Make a moving schwa, uh, slicha, and resting. You guys did a resting schwa for both of them, I'm just saying. All right, so in this case though, it's a moving schwa, so it's gonna sound like buh, buh, buh. All right, so then when we go back to, ah, uh, it's very big here. When we go back to our lesson and our first two words, uh, I think I have to come back to this page because you can't see the invisible letters here. Yep. These two words, the first word of the Torah, starts with a b. You see it? B. And then the second word of the Torah starts with a ba. So this one's a b, and this one's a ba. By the way, this teeny tiny letter here, that just tells you that we're at Genesis 1, 1. That's showing me the verse. Um, the chapter is Genesis 1. That's not showing on here anywhere. And that's just showing me that we're at 1, 1. So the very first letter is b. Most of what we're doing is supposed to be learning how to pronounce the letters. But because we're actually learning Torah text, I'm gonna take an aside every once in a while and I'm gonna teach you something about the text too. So people are going to learn this on different levels. Some people are gonna be so happy to learn vocabulary and some people are happy to learn the sounds. Some people are gonna find it really cool to hear some of the insights about the Torah. So I wanna show you the very first letter in the Torah is a bet. Now, if you were studying this in English, it would not make any sense. Well, what's the first word in the Torah in English? In? So don't, most of you have a translation that says something like in the beginning, right? So it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to ask why the Bible or why God created the world starting with the letter I. It doesn't make any sense at all. But it makes a lot of sense to ask the question, why did God create the world, write the Torah, starting with the letter bet? There were all of these letters God could have chosen. Why did God start with the letter bet? And there are a number of answers that the rabbis have given, and I would love to know that you come up with something creative as well, because that's part of what we do is we try to figure it out. Also, almost every version of the Torah that you get, a written version of the Torah, whether it's in the Torah scroll in the ark, or whether it's a Torah book, most of the time when you see this word in the beginning, it's going to have a bigger bet. There is no such thing as a capital letter in Hebrew. And so why would we have a bigger bet in the Torah and why would we start with b? And so I can tell you some things. I can tell you that we don't start with a bigger bet just because it's the beginning of the Torah. A lot of us are used to having what's called an illuminated letter at the beginning of the word, at the beginning of a chapter, let's say, that you make this really fancy first letter. That's not what's happening here. Because if that were the case, then we would see fancy first letters for other books. And we see some letters that are bigger throughout the Torah, but it's not at the beginning. In fact, in, the, in Leviticus, 
Leviticus, the last letter of the word, is smaller instead of the first letter of the word being bigger. So I don't think that's the reason, but you could say it is. I better fix this. Um, but one reason is, if you look at the shape of the bet, each of these letters used to be a pictogram so that it, it represented a picture of something. And the picture that the bet represents is a bayat, is a house. So you can kind of see a house here, a little door, there's your doorknob. So imagine that this door is open and all of Torah, all of the creation of the world is coming out of it. Can you see that as a possibility? That's a possibility. There's also this wonderful story in the Talmud about how each letter came to beg to God to be the first letter of creation. And in the story, it starts at the very, very end. And the letter Tav, which is the last letter, says, please, God, pick me because I start the word Torah. So I deserve to have a prominent place in the creation story. And God says, well, that's true, but you also start other words, like a word that means sinning and things like that. So it's not you. And one by one, going backwards through the Aleph Bet, each letter would plead to God, make its case, that it should be the first letter of, the t of creation. And each time God pointed out that even though the letters did good things, sometimes the letters did bad things. They started bad words. Sometimes it wasn't because they started bad words that God didn't choose them. Sometimes it was because they were very important, like the letter Yud starts some of the ways of showing God's name. So, God, so how do we get to the bet? In the very, very end of the story, God takes the, the bet, comes up and pleads and says, pick me because I start the word bracha, blessing. And God says, you know, that's a good thing. Let's pick bracha. I'm going to do that. I'm going to pick you. I'm going to pick the bet. And then all of a sudden, God noticed that the first letter of the Aleph bet, which is the Aleph, was sitting, not surprisingly, quietly. How loud is the Aleph? The Aleph was sitting quietly in the corner, and the Aleph didn't get to plead its case. And God went to the Aleph and said, why didn't you plead your case? And Aleph said, well, I was waiting for my turn, and then when you gave it to Bet, I wasn't going to take it away from Bet. That wouldn't it be appropriate. And God saw that Aleph began words like humility, and God said, because you were so considerate and because you were so humble, I will start the Decalogue with you. That's the story. But I bet you can come up with other reasons why we start with a bet and why the bet is bigger, because that's using our imagination. One of the cool things about Hebrew, especially biblical Hebrew, is it's not just the words that are important, but it's the shape of the letters, it's the sound of the letters, and it's not just the shape and the sound of the letters, it's also the absence of what you see. So when I'm looking at a bet, it's not just about the shape that makes it a bet, but it's about the emptiness also over here, like the fact that we said, this is open this way, that's important as well. So think about the letter and what it might inspire you to come up with about why the creation was started with a b. Um, I can tell you one other thing that's kind of cool. I did show you before how the Aleph Bet, after the Aleph, after Bet, we have the Vet, and that the difference between the Bet and the Vet was that there's that dot in there. When I put the Dagesh in a Bet, the difference between the b and the v is that you make the, putting the dagesh, that dot, makes that a plosive, it's called, a plosive consonant. So you've heard of things that explode, and you've heard of things that implode. Well, when you have a bet, it just plodes. And ploding is kind of a nice sound for creating the world, I think. So that's our first letter, bet. And we've got some, some practice that you can do. And then we go to the next letter. And the next letter that we're going to learn, I should ask if there are questions about Raish. Question? I don't know why bet is the beginning of You know why bet is the beginning of the word? Yeah, what? stands for uh, B stands for B. Actually, I'm going to tell you something a little bit breaks my heart. Most of us have grown up with a translation that says that Bereshit means in the beginning. I think that's a terrible translation. I think it's terrible. And I'll, I'll explain why as we learn more letters and things. B can mean in, so that's okay. B is a prefix, and it can mean in, it could mean with. But I don't see a, I don't see exactly a the beginning. I see other things. Once we get to the rest of the letters, I'll explain to you why I 
don't love that translation. The other thing that I love is the fact that I don't have to find only one translation when I'm looking at Torah. I love the fact that I can find many nuances. I love the fact that what I like to say is that Torah is very ambiguous. I love that fact. It means that each time I look at it, I might find new insights. If I looked at it and I knew that this is how it was and there's no changing and there's no modification and this is how you have to answer it, which is usually what we find when we look at things in English, it would make me sad. Let me tell you a story that, about why we're studying Hebrew and why the Hebrew is much more wonderful than the English. And we'll find more as we get through this one day. But let's go back to the book of Job. In the book of Job, terrible, terrible things happen to Job. His children die and his crops die and he gets this terrible skin disease and all these awful things are happening to him and he has a wife. And so if these awful things are happening to him, most of these things are affecting her as well. She's losing her crops, she's losing her children, her husband's got this terrible skin disease. And so she has one sentence. What's the one thing that she gets to say? Anybody remember? Hmm? What does she say in your translation? In, in your translation, she says, curse God and die, which would make sense. God is treating you terribly. If you curse God and get it over with, you would stop suffering. But the Hebrew that's used there is the word for bless. Bless God and die. The word that she uses is bless God and die. And so it's kind of unfair that when we read it in translation, someone has already told us that, well, she said bless, but obviously she meant curse. It's something called saginahor, which means something like uh, enlightening a blind person. It's a, it's a euphemism because you don't want to say, whoop, you don't ever want to say curse and God in the same breath, so you'll say euphemism to say it in a nicer way. You'll say bless God, but we know what it means. I tell the story about how when my kids were, I think, in, in, in middle school, there was a book that they were supposed to read that I had never read before. It was called Cold Sassy Tree. And it's about a grandfather and a grandson. And the grandfather is the first person in the whole town to get a car. And the grandson learns how to drive the car and something terrible happened that made the grandfather very angry. And the grandfather the, the, comes home that day and sees the grandson. And the book says, and he blessed him up and down all day long. I don't think it meant he blessed him up and down all day long. I think he said a lot of words that probably shouldn't have been repeated. And we know that that's what he meant, even though the word said bless. But when you hear the word bless him, it feels different than when you hear the word curse him. And if it said, and his father cursed him up and down, or yelled at him, or shouted at him, it feels very different, even though the words may have been the same, as when it says, and he blessed him up and down. And I think it's not fair that someone else has already decided for you, and gotten to hear that for you, and translated it for you, even if it was supposed to mean the same thing. So. We will be finding our own insights out, but one of my insights in this is I really don't like the translation in the beginning. And I'll let you have it for now, but I'm gonna try to change that. So I like your story, but I wanna come up with another one that doesn't have it mean in the beginning. So that's our first letter. The second letter is this one. Actually, it's already here. It's the core shape that we already had for the bet. It's rounded, like your rosh is rounded and it's a rounded resh, it sounds like r. Now let me tell you, if you're Israeli, you're not gonna say it like r. You're gonna say it a lot more like a French r. It's gonna be way back here, it's gonna be something like r. There used to be, and I don't know if it still is the case, there used to be an official pronunciation that if you were going to be a, a news broadcaster, you had to make it a gently trilled resh, like this r. So if you were gonna say like Torah, it would have to be gently trilled, almost like Spanish. But no Israeli I know will say it like that. Most of the time, they'll say it way back here like this, Torah, America. It'll be way back here, it's a glottal thing. So Reish, if you want to sound Israeli, you're gonna to want to say Reish, way back here, Reish. But having said that, unless you're under the age of 10, which very few of us in this room are under the age of 10, there's a very good possibility that you will never sound like you're Israeli, no matter how hard you try. So one of the lessons that I teach you to do is stand in front of the mirror every once in a while and say, yes, I am from America, or yes, I am from Shreveport, because that's what you're gonna sound like, no matter how hard you try. And the truth is, 
it's not always helpful to pretend that you're something that you aren't. Because, you know, you get there and you sound really Israeli and they say, what's the best bus for Haifa? And you go, <laughs> you know, because you sound too good. So it's okay for you to sound like who you are, especially if you're older, over the age of 10 and you kind of have no choice anymore. Um, some of us have picked up enough languages growing up that they have enough language tools, sound tools, that they could sound like Israeli better than others. But most of us are going to just have to live with the fact that we will always sound like where we've come from. And it's okay. But uh, so if you want to say Ruh for Resh, you will, nobody will, they, they won't laugh, they'll just know where you're from, and that's okay. You're from Shreveport, you're not from Shreveport. Okay, then that's okay. So in this case, we have a Resh, Resh. And on my tapes, I try to make it sound as, most of my teachers, starting with before I was 10, most of my teachers were Israeli. So when I studied Hebrew, the only accent I was hearing was an Israeli accent. When I got to Israel, I lived in Israel from 78 to 79, my Hebrew sounded very authentic, and I didn't know how which bus was to Haifa. So I know how that feels, but um, eventually, a lot of my Israeli Hebrew sounded more Italian. That's a long story. So this right here, that resh with this vowel, what does it sound like with this vowel? E, so it's re, re, okay? And we can go to page, I'm gonna go from here, Hebrew from day one, and we're gonna do the resh. And we're gonna do the practice from here. Whoop, and let's practice these. We've got ra. Uh, and by the way, if you do the practice with me, I usually set it up so that you've got three different ways of practicing on the audio tape. So if I say, let's practice the letter Rish, so then you're going to go and either you wait for me to say it and then you repeat after me, or you say it first and then you see if you were right, because I usually say, let's practice the letter Rish, and then I'll pause, and then I'll say, Ra, uh, and pause, Ra. Uh. You can practice it, you can say it before me, and see if you said it correctly. You can repeat after me if you're not feeling very confident about things, or you can try very hard to say it with me, which is pr practically impossible, because most of these things I was doing like 11 o'clock at night. You'll hear me do my, my nighttime voice. Yes? Is that which gimel? This is a rounded resh, you see? Ra. See that? Ra, resh. So let's read them together. So what's this say? Ra, ra, and this one? Ra, sorry about that, there's this thing. This does not belong there, it's not part of it. Then re, re, this one is re, re, this one is ri, ri, and this one is ri, ri, and this one is ro, we're over here, ro, and this one is also ro, it's the saddest, most misunderstood vowel. And Mr. Bat is up at bat and it goes into his stomach and he says, ooh, it's roo. And this one is a zooming down the tube slide and this one is roo. And this one is a moving schwa under a resh and it's just ra, ra. Slicha. So we've gotten, and, and just by the way, well, these are the old ones. Um, they're, they're show me's to practice with in case you forget what's going on. These show me's teach the letters as well. So we've got two letters down. The next letter is fun and easy because the next letter is the Aleph. So the cool thing about the Aleph, so we already learned that the bet has a bar on the bottom and a base that goes beyond and a ball in the belly. And that's what made it sound like B. And the Resh is rounded, like the back of your Rosh. You know the holiday Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year? It means the head of the year, Rosh, it's a beginning. But this letter, the Aleph, Aleph is really cool because Aleph, remember I talked about the fact that you want to look at what the letter is shaped like? So the Aleph is open, is pointing, is pointing in each direction. We've got, this is pointing, oh, this is a fancy one. So normally when you write it, you're not going to write it that kind of fancy. If you write it down, it doesn't have to have that leg on the bottom. Aleph is going to look like this. You've got the line that goes like this. You've got above here, it starts, and it goes to just below the center. And you've got above the center, it comes down, and that's what the olive looks like. And you'll notice that the olive is pointing in every direction. I like to remember that the word for God, 
We've got two little words for God that start with this letter, El, or the one we're about to see at the beginning of next lesson is Elohim. It starts with the letter Aleph. I think it's very cool because it is open in all directions. And in the directions where it's not open, then that's not pointing, it's, it's open with an invisible marker. So everywhere you look with the Aleph, it's open. And what does it sound like? Just open. It's actually a glottal stop, which means your throat closes and opens. So if you were to say the word, ouch, if you, at the beginning of the word, ouch, you'll notice that your throat closes and opens before you get to, let's say, the O. So try it. Say, ouch, ouch, ouch. That's the glottal stop. It closes and opens before you get to an, a vowel. That's what the Aleph sounds like. For most practical purposes, you can think of it as a silent consonant, except there are no silent consonants. Um, they each serve a purpose, and they each have something to contribute. So the Aleph is kind of silent, but it's really a glottal stop. In this case, in our first word here in the Torah, we had a B and a Re, and then we have an Aleph, and something strange is happening in this word, and that is that the Aleph has no vowel because the Aleph itself is part of a vowel. Remember when we saw the dot with your ear bent down? That's what's happening here, that the Aleph is becoming part of this vowel. So it starts with an E, and then the Aleph is part of that vowel. In this case, it's a vowel letter. It's what's called a vowel letter. We're gonna see it here too, where you have the E dot and the Yud. You can ignore this little smiley thing. I'll talk about that later. But the E dot and then the Yud, that's gonna sound like E. The Aleph, when I attach the Aleph to this E, eh, it's gonna make it sound not like E, eh, but A eh, in this case. It's kind of making that E eh longer. So we have A, eh, we have the diphthong. So this is gonna sound like Re instead of just Re. So let's do some Aleph practice, because Aleph practice actually does some cool things whoop, that the other letters didn't do. So we have Aleph. So let's practice Aleph. What's the first sound? Ah, and this one, ah, and this, eh, and, whoop, we're over here, eh, and this one is e, and this one is e, and then Mr. Vav is up at bat and the pitch goes over and it sounds like o, oh, and the saddest, most misunderstood vowel sounds like o, oh, and then it's going into his stomach and it says oo, and it's zooming down the tube and it says oo, but now we have something unusual. In order to have a moving schwa, in order to have a uh, you have to have a consonant that it can uh off of. Like you could have b, and that's what's left over after your b is the uh. But the olive, because it's silent, cannot have a moving schwa all by itself. It needs to have something uh to let go, to, to have it afterwards. So what it has instead is it has helper vowels. There are times when you need to have a moving schwa underneath a, an olive. And when you do, you've got a helper vowel. So what you see is this part. And you're gonna see a moving schwa, but you're gonna hear, ah. You're gonna see like this. So you're gonna have a moving schwa. It's acting like a moving schwa, but you're gonna hear, eh. And in this case, you're gonna see the moving schwa, and it's gonna be acting like an oh. It's, these are all the short vowel versions. So we have, four essentially silent letters, and each time we have those, we're gonna have these as our moving schwa. We're not gonna see just a regular moving schwa. When the consonant is essentially silent, or they're called the, the, the guttural letters, or the silent guttural letters, the quiet guttural letters, it's going to have a, a helper vowel. So that's unusual, and that's the only one that we're gonna have to worry about for that today. So now we've got bore, we've got that much and let's take a look at this word. So this is, what does it sound like? Ba. And then this sounds like ra. So we have ba. And then we have an aleph here. An aleph at the end of a word, just be silent. So that sounds like ba. That's a whole word all by itself. In all of the Semitic languages, they have three root letters. Most of their, many of their words, their verbs, their nouns, their adjectives, have three core root letters. 
the three core root letters for this word are the three letters that you see, bet, resh, and aleph. And the bet, resh, aleph core verb means he created. This word means he created. Bara means he created. That's what that word means. I'll show you something cool about that. So obviously we know that's what's going on. We've got a he created situation. But I'll show you something else. You see this first word? The first three letters of that word are bet, resh, aleph, too. So hidden in that first word is also the fact that there's creation going on. Although that's not what it means in the first word, even though we were talking about that. Because the buh with this prefix means inner with. And the resh and the aleph are part of something that's coming next, the core of this word, and not just the prefix. But when you look backwards, you see a repetition. You see the bet, resh, aleph, and the bet, resh, aleph. I think that's part of what is awesome and elegant about this creation story. Uh, and I'll tell you something else. We're hearing, and we'll talk about this more as we get further into the lessons, into the, the first day. When you have a baby, which is what we have right now, we have a baby world. When you have a baby, you're going to hear a lot of ba 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 ba. That's a sound they can make. They could do those lip things. And when you're talking to the baby, there's an awful lot of repetition. It could be something as exciting as good night, moon, good night, table, good night. It could be something like that. It could be that they want to hear the same book over and over again. It could be that you're going to say, here's mommy. Where's your mommy? I'm your mommy. Who's and you say the same thing over and over again so that you can teach the baby something. Or it's a ball. Look at the ball. Get the ball. And you say it over and over again, and it helps them to learn. What's happening here is poetry and elegance for a baby. We have an infant world going on. And you're going to see more of that as our text continues, I think. So we have those three letters. Now we get to this one. So what I want you to do for this one is take these fingers, three fingers, and I want you to put them in front of your mouth. And I want you to make air, pretend that these are your front teeth. And I want you to make air come through them like this. Shh. That's the sound that this makes. It's a shin. The word shin means tooth. And it's showing you what happens when you have a tooth. Shh. Sound coming out of your teeth. Shh. So if we were to draw the shin, it would look like this. With a dot on the right side. And that's supposed to be there. Shh. That's your front teeth. Shh. So if I need you to quiet down, I'll say shh. And if I have this vowel with it, this now you can ignore this little black scoopy thing. The scoopy thing is actually a trope mark. It's going to teach me a few things. And I would rather not talk about that this lesson. I'd rather talk about that by next lesson. But this scoopy thing and this pointy thing, those are trope marks. And they're going to teach me what the accented syllable is, they're going to teach me how to phrase it, and they're going to teach me how to sing it or chant it if I were going to chant it. But they're not vowels, and I don't want to confuse you today about that. I can tell you that it is the accented syllable, so if we can read that whole word, it'll tell me where my accent is. This word we can read already. So this word is ba, ra, but if I were reading it as a whole word, I would say ba with the accents on the second syllable. And I know that because I've got this little scoopy thing here. So... Let's take a look at sh, and what's the vowel with the sh? We've got, whoops, too many letters. We've got this, e, so it sounds like she. So we have she. So, so far we have b, re, she, she. So let's see if we can practice our shin. Let's go back to here, here's our shin. I'll tell you what, let me show you this. This is an old version of the show me file, but let me show you, I've got newer versions for each of the letters. And I will update this soon, but for now. We are going to learn about the letter shin. Whoop. Three fingers. And put them in front of your mouth like this. And make air come through your teeth like this. Shh. This is then very you would have the letter shin, the letter shin. Let's take a look at that letter. The letter shin means tooth in Hebrew. Let's see how to draw one. If we take a line going down and over and up again with a line in the middle, 
it looks like those, your teeth, your front teeth, or those three fingers in front of your teeth. Put a dot on the right, and that's a shh. Let's try it again. Coming over and up, and a line in the middle, shh, with a dot there. Some people will make it like this, with a line going sideways. Let's see. Kind of like the picture over here that we have. We're going to try making some more shins. This is, I was just learning how to use the program. Put so. a vowel there, something like this. That sha. Like sha. How about another one? A shin with a vowel like this. Shoo. And another shin with a vowel like this. Sh. Let's practice the shin with all of the vowels. Oh, you can do that. Sha. Or not. Sha. You can do that. I learned the hard way that if you're using an iPad, you don't have a cursor. Like here, I can say, all right, let's do this one. Sha, sha, sha. There's no cursor. So I had to figure out ways to point to the one we're about to do. And I would do these little dots and stuff like that. But I got more sophisticated eventually in this. But that's all posted right here. That's what happens when you look at the purple show me ones. Uh, all right, so we have one more letter that we learned for the first day lesson of the first day of creation. And this is the letter Tav. I want to show you the Tav. The Tav starts just like the Bet and the Resh. And it starts with this same core shape. Only this time, instead of putting a base on the bottom, we attach at the top and you make a tail or a toe at the bottom left. So you'd start with this core and then you have attached at the top or a tail at the toe at the bottom left. And it sounds like t. It's the last letter of the alphabet. So you have now learned the first letter of the alphabet and the last letter of the alphabet. And I'm going to show you that sometimes the tav, often the tav has a digation it also. So it's also going to, in modern pronunciation, Israeli pronunciation, if there's a dot in there, it's going to sound like t. If you go to the other synagogue, or you hear other people who are speaking or reading in an Ashkenazic way, Eastern European way, you'll hear them pronounce the tav without the dagesh as s. And in some dialects, you might have heard the tav without the dagesh as a th. So for example, you may know congregations called Beth El, or B'nai Brith. And why would they write it as a th? Because there is, in modern Hebrew, there is no th at all. That's because that's a, a softer t. When you take out that dagesh, you no longer have that plosive. And so in some dialects, we would have it as a th. And some, it'll be a s. So you may have heard things like simchas Torah or bas mitzvah or something like that. And that would be saying the tav with no dagesh as a s. And they might even pronounce that, say that that letter is a sav with no dagesh and a tav with a dagesh. But for us who are trying to learn Hebrew in a way that they speak in modern Israel, as it's a more practical way of learning the Hebrew language for our purposes, tav with a dagesh or without a dagesh is always going to sound like ta. So let's practice reading this one. So we start at the right and we go to ta, ta, te, te. And now I'm going to say something embarrassing. T. T, I can't help being embarrassing sometimes when we're practicing all these sounds. I don't do it on purpose. Then we have to, and we have to, and tu, and tu, and t. And that is all of the letters of the first two words of the creation story. And so, let's see where we have it here. So if we look at this, we're in the first sentence, first two words. The first two words are, Bereshit bara. Bereshit bara. The very first words. Bereshit, by the way, is also the name of the book. If you were talking about the five books of Moses, you know in English they are general electric lights never dim. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But in Hebrew, the book of Genesis is called Bereshit because it's the first unique word of the, of the section. And in case, in, in fact, in this one, it's the very first word, period. So Bereshit. And usually when I refer to, if you'll hear somebody referring to creation, and they'll refer to creation as Bereshit sometimes. 
even though that's not exactly what the word means. We'll talk more about what the word means next time. But that's the end. I hope that you go to the website and practice using that. Some years, we, if you need help, if you don't have a printer and you need help printing out the lessons and things, we can do that too. But otherwise, it's all on the computer already, and it's down there. And next week, we will continue with lesson two. And I appreciate you very much. Thank you. We're about to start our next class. <laughs>